Thank you. Thank you all for inviting me here today. I'm really excited to share about our work on this Real Talk project and how we apply design thinking to our research. So first, I wanted to talk about why I do this work, because I think it's really under, important to understand. I'm a former Teach for America Corps member. So I'm first a high school educator. I taught high school bio and chemistry in rural eastern North Carolina, moved to North Carolina 10 years ago, and lived in my first rural setting. And even though North Carolina has really great sex ed standards, and it's supposed to be mandated that all seventh through ninth grade students get comprehensive sex ed, I found in the classroom that many of my students had never even talked about sex uh, in school with their parents. And so that really fuels the work that I do today. And I wear many hats and will also own that design thinking has many flavors. And so Stanford has their own version, MIT. I'm formally trained in IDEO's version of design thinking. And IDEO is a world-renowned design firm based in San Francisco. So what is Real Talk? It's a mobile app that teens ages 13 to 15 use. And we use real stories submitted by our real users to convey relevant and credible information about sexual health. In the app, users can browse, search, and share stories and access linked high quality online resources within the app. So we are direct to consumer. We know that adults and institutions might be the barrier for why young people can't access sex education. And so we've chosen to go straight to them via their phones. We also are really interested in building communication skills, which we do through our chat feature. And that's how they, they share their stories with us. And we're also really interested in linking teens to high quality existing resources like amaze.org. We've been featured in a variety of different sources, including Teen Vogue, Fast Company, and TechCrunch. So very briefly, 15 minutes or less was my challenge to present an overview of design thinking, describe our design thinking approach for developing our Real Talk app, and then end with some opportunities for innovation for you all to think about. So with regards to a design thinking overview, first of all, how many of you have heard of design thinking in this room? OK, about a third of you, which is great. So design thinking is a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. This is one of my favorite images. And so most of the time, we might think about one of these circles or even two of these circles. But it's very infrequent that we actually think about all three of these things as we're developing interventions in the public health or medical sphere. And so we really care about the desirability. Why would people want to do the thing that we're asking them to do? Technologically feasible, trying to figure out what is already out there that we can make use of. And then the last piece that we've heard being talked about today, just figuring out will this thing actually success, like be successful in the real business world and understanding that up front. And so design thinking is three things. It's an approach or process. It's also a set of discrete methods and tools, as well as a set of mindsets. So it's been really popular in the private sector. And so some popular services and products include Spotify and Fitbit. These companies have used design thinking to create their products. With regards to the design thinking approach, IDEO chunks it into three distinct phases. And so the first phase is inspiration. And it covers all you want to know about the people that you are trying to design for and their impressions or their interactions with the current challenge at hand. And so it requires a lot of divergent thinking and building empathy for your intended audience. After that, we go through a very specific ideation phase. And so oftentimes, we gravitate towards one idea. Or because the grant mechanism that we're applying for specifies a type of intervention, we don't get the opportunity to actually fully embrace the ideation phase. But thinking through all the different ideas that currently exist or could exist to solve your particular challenge, and then converging and diverging again, and then ending with an implementation phase that really focuses on failing quickly to learn fast in iterative cycles. So trying lots of things in the real world, gathering data, figuring out what's working, what isn't, and then using that information to move forward. So here's this graphic. Traditional problem solving, we might converge on a solution very, very early. And then we spend a lot of time on the back end trying to figure out how to make it work in the real world, how to get our population of interest to actually like use it, how to convince other people to fund this continuous research. And so it's very, very messy after we've arrived at the solution. 
On the flip side, design thinking acknowledges and owns that a lot of this messiness and thinking has to be done up front. And so a lot of divergent and convergent thinking, a lot of deeply understanding users and the market go into design thinking so that at the end of a couple of weeks, a couple of months, not years, you are able to be really confident in whatever solution that you're putting resources behind. So IDU again does put together a really nice online PDF as well as a printed guide that you can get off of Amazon called the Field Guide to Human-Centered Design. And it offers explicit step-by-step -step instructions for how to do some of the activities that fall under each of those three different phases. And here are the, de the design thinking mindsets that are really important. And sometimes contrary to what you might have been taught or what your work culture might be, but two, make it, three, learn from failure, and then seven, iterate, iterate, iterate are really important to design thinking. So the design challenge that we had as a team of three for our tech nonprofit was how might we develop a technological solution for teen pregnancy prevention or teen pregnancy? So OAH awarded two grants, one to um, a school in the South and then another to uh, Power to Decide, which was formerly the national campaign to prevent teen and unplanned pregnancy, to leverage design thinking and to create some sort of technological solution for teen pregnancy. And what they did was they essentially ran an accelerator program and looked for 10 teams of three. For our specific design challenge to address that bigger question, we focused in on a smaller question. And so we thought about how might we increase access to high quality comprehensive sex ed to teens ages 13 to 15 across the US, knowing that specifically in North Carolina, the percentage of teens who initiate sex doubles between an eighth and ninth grade. And so we applied for the accelerator program with our brilliant idea. We thought that because a couple of us had taught before, we were like, great, we've recently been in the classroom, we definitely know what teens want, and we are gonna go with the sex ed mobile app for schools. It's gonna have lots of facts and stats, tests and quizzes, Q&A, and students are going to love it. And so we went through the first phase of design thinking. The purpose of this phase, again, is to learn directly from the people you're designing for. So you immerse yourself in their lives in order to deeply understand their needs. And so the first thing that we did was identify extremes and mainstreams. And so this is a normal curve. And design thinking says that an idea that suits extreme users will nearly certainly work for the majority of others. And so explicitly identifying people on the edges and working with them to understand their experiences and creating a solution for them will inherently include everybody else in the middle. So for us, that meant we were looking at students who were really tech savvy, had never used their phones in their lives, students who had had multiple romantic relationships, students who never thought about dating before, parents who had like always talked to their kids from a young, young age about sex and relationships, parents who had never talked to their kids, uh, religious leaders who embedded sex, into, sex ed into Sunday school lessons, religious leaders who really didn't want anything to do with it. But those were the groups of people that we went to and interviewed and followed and essentially watched them as they went through their everyday lives and then asked a bunch of follow-up questions. And then the second thing that we found was really impactful, especially with young people, was card sorts. And so we know that young people, sometimes we ask them a question, they might not be able to formulate something right on the spot. And so we asked them a lot of questions about where they would feel safest talking about sex and relationships, with whom, and had pre-made cards, and then asked them to sort them and rank them. And so that was also really informative for us to learn about what they were thinking. And with regards to inspiration, after speaking to about 60 people in this first round, we learned that schools are not the preferred place to learn about sex and relationships. Teens do care about privacy, source credibility, and safety. Currently, they get their info from peers, Google, and porn, and teens prefer to use their smartphones instead of computers to access Google and porn. So taking that info, we went into the second phase, ideation, and so the purpose of this phase is to identify opportunities to design and prototype or test possible solutions with the real intended users. And so we held a bunch of co-creation sessions where we brought teens together, gave them pens, pencils, markers, and blank iPhone screens and pose questions to them like, how might we share facts and stories about sex and relationships with teens ages 13 to 15? We'd give them time to work independently, to go through and draw out what they think, 
And then we asked them to essentially pitch their ideas to others in the room. And we paid close attention to what they were saying and how they were pitching it, because that was really informative for what teens really wanted out of the app and how they would market it to their peers. We also rapidly prototyped. So once we realized that we were going to go with some sort of app, we had a couple different ideas and literally used PowerPoint to create prototypes that we would put in front of teens and then ask them very quickly to think about what this app would be used for, what they liked and didn't like about it already, and to get more feedback from that. So after ideation, we figured out that teens want to know that they're not alone. They want to read stories instead of facts. They want to read text message combos instead of prose. And they like reading stories from different perspectives. So then we went into the implementation phase. And the purpose of this phase is to turn your actual idea into reality and to test it in the real world. And so we did a bunch of live prototyping. Instead of going straight to building a native app, we hired a web developer who essentially made a website that rendered on your phone like it was a mobile app, because that was much quicker and also much cheaper. And so we then tested these versions with young people and asked them while they were sitting there with their phones playing with it for the real-time feedback. And then after that, we also did some larger pilots where we, uh, uh, we had the actual app ready to go and then pushed it to different users and then had teens actually use it for a week or two at a time. And then we would, on the back end, collect the data and actually see how much time they'd been spending on it, what they were doing, and when they were doing it to really inform our refinement. So key findings, the name of the app matters. Uh, app store descriptions matter. Teens wanted to browse stories easily, like Instagram, which they couldn't do in our original version. And then teens wanted to continue to inform decision making. And so that's why we have a teen advisory board for our nonprofit. We released the beta version of our app in September 2017 with the features of being able to read stories, search stories, click on links to learn more, and to submit stories. Here are some of the screenshots of it. And so on the left, it, is, it shows the story tiles. So much like Instagram, they're very used to browsing. They browse story tiles. Once they click on it, this is a version of a short story, but this story renders as a chat combo. And at the bottom, there's a button where they can click on the link so that they can learn more. And then within the app, they're directed to that high quality online resource. So as of yesterday, we had more than 14,500 users uh, in all 50 states and over 100 countries. They have read more than 160,000 stories in our app and have accessed more than or close to 9,000 resources. 73% of our users find Real Talk stories helpful, and over 60% learn something new in reading their first 10 stories. And at this point, we are still going through our larger evaluation, but are excited by the results and want to thank the supporters that we've had along the way. And with regards to you all and your charge as a committee, my co-founders and I thought through this long and hard about what are things that would be truly impactful and would be modifiable that you all could recommend. So here are the challenges or opportunities that we pose to you. How might we create funding opportunities, one, where populations and health problems are identified, but the solutions are less prescribed? Two, create funding opportunities that expect meaningful engagement, engagement with intended audiences in all stages of solution, design, development, and implementation. Three, how might we create funding opportunities that require multiple iterations of proposed solutions and real world testing? And then lastly, four, how might we create funding opportunities that foster greater collaboration instead of competition among grantees? And so with that, I yield my time. And if you have any questions, either ask some of me in the panel or email me.